uh, as in the church age, we are likened unto spiritual uh, Israel. And the question is, uh, what is our uh, relationship with New Jerusalem as opposed to the, uh, the, new, uh, the new heaven and the new earth that's coming? All right. I'll turn to Revelation on New Jerusalem and get a revelation of where New Jerusalem is defined in chapter 21. Now, <clears throat> the way this thing works here is if you're in hyper-dispensationalism, my people like Cornelius Stam and Baker and Bullinger and that bunch, uh, they'll try to tell you that New Jerusalem is a Jewish city. It's not for the bride of Christ, a Jewish city. Make everything Jewish possible because the gates have the 12 apostles on it. They're Jewish apostles and this and that. And they forget all kind of things. Uh, uh, Hyperdispensationalists are not really students of Scripture at all. They're, they're fakers. Uh, Hyperdispensationalists believe the Bible has clear cuts at certain places. And certain places it does. But then the hyperdispensational thing, you come along there and say, okay, uh, the Jews are up to here and then Gentile there. Or the book of Acts up to here and then Gentile here. The body of Christ begins here and then it ends here. And in dispensation, you finally get down to where all you have for the church is the Pauline epistles. That's all you got for the church. And the rest of it's for Israel. Now, if you're a real dispensationalist, like Bullinger, you go much further than that. If you're a real dispensationalist, you'll say, well, only the Pauline epistles written after the book of Acts are for the church. So the dispensationalists among themselves get kind of screwed up. Cornelius Stam says the body begins with Acts 9. Then O'Hare and Baker says the body begins with Acts 18. Bullinger says the body begins with Acts 28. So Bullinger cuts out everything during the Acts period as applying to the church and makes it all Jewish. And his reason for that is the Act of the Apostles, the Jewish Apostles, are ministering to Israel, therefore the signs are for them, not for the church, so forth and so on. But that thing ain't going to work. If you ever take that position, you've got to throw away Romans. It's written during the Acts period. You've got to throw away First and Second Corinthians. They're written in the Acts period. You've got to throw away Galatians and First and Second Thessalonians. You've got to tear your Bible all to pieces if you mess with that thing. But that's what the effort is. Now before we get into this, notice that Israel and the church have three things said about them that no dispensationalist ever got straight. Now here's the first one. You as a Christian are supposed to grow up in the fullest, the stature of Christ. The fullness of Christ, that's likening you to a man, conformed to his image. The body of Christ is likened to a man in that, those pastors. But the body of Christ is likened to a woman. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We're a member of his body, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Adam says of his wife, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So the body of Christ is likened to a man and likened to a woman, and by that is not likened to a son. As many received him, they gave him to become sons of God. God sent the Spirit in your heart, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore you no more a servant, but a son. You're adopted. Now those are similitudes, see? There are similarities. And those similitudes, the body of Christ is first likened to Christ himself, like a man, the measure of the fullest stature of Christ. Then like a woman, Eve, the body of Christ, his bride, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Then the son was born of him. That's Israel. Israel is called a man. What's Israel? It's Jacob. That's a man. That's Jacob's name, Israel. Your name is no longer Jacob, it's Israel. You ever heard, Lord, back in the book of Hosea said, Jacob has done this, and Jacob Ephraim has done this, and Ephraim has done that. He's not talking about the man Ephraim born of Joseph. He's talking about the ten northern tribes. So the nation is likened to a man, Israel. The nation is likened to a son, Exodus. Israel is my firstborn. Go to say to Pharaoh, let my son go, or I'll kill your son, even your son. Right? And a woman, Hosea chapter 2. I'll take her and bring her to the wilderness and speak comfort to her, and she shall sing as she did in the days I brought her out of the land of Egypt. Throughout that Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 16, Ezekiel chapter 23, is likened to a woman who is a cast-off wife. Hosea, thus saith the Lord, I am not her husband, and she is not my wife. Hosea chapter 1, chapter 2. That's one thing these divorced fellows get, get uh, they kind of got a problem with. I mean, Lord says, when I, I divorce that woman, she don't do, don't she say, I've got a living wife. 
she ain't my wife. These fellows say, if they got two living wives, three living wives, they're, they're calling God an adulterer. Of course, they don't know that because that's because they're stupid. <laughs> Read your Bible and you'll find out. All right, get Hosea. I want uh, Hosea in here. Get Hosea and get Hosea chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Israel like a woman. Right now, she's a cast off wife. She's a divorced wife that's going to be remarried to her husband. And her husband, not Jesus Christ. Hosea 2, 1. Say to your brethren, Ame, to your sisters, Ruama, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. And then on down there, look at verse uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. He's going to remarry her, verse 19. I'll betroth thee. I will betroth thee. God is going to remarry Israel. Right now she's an adulterous woman put off. How do you know? Chapter 3, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to me, Go yet love a woman, beloved of her husband, a friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. Israel is a woman, and she's a child, and she's a man. Three similitudes. That's true of the church. The church is pictured as a growing the measure of the fullest stature of Christ as a male. It's pictured as the body of Christ, a female belonging to Christ, and it's pictured as sons born of God. All right, Revelation chapter 21, here's a description of New Jerusalem. And New Jerusalem in uh, Revelation chapter 21, when he's describing it, he says about this, he says, verse 13, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them, the foundation, are the name the twelve apostles of the Lamb, Jewish. They're all Jews, all twelve of them. Apostles of the Lamb, Paul isn't there. That's the twelve. Paul's not the twelfth apostle, he's the thirteenth apostle. The way that works is you have these 12 apostles and one of them defects, Judas. Of those you gave me, I've, uh, I've kept them all. None is lost but the son of perdition. The scripture might be fulfilled. Acts chapter 1, they choose lots and replace uh, Judas with uh, Matthias, Justice, the other, the other apostle. Then they have 12 again. Now the reason why you know that is the 12 is because a little bit later in Acts chapter 12, James gets his head cut off. And when James gets his head cut off, they don't choose any other apostle to take his place. So that shows the twelve are the twelve. And Paul some extra. So this is a Jewish foundation of this New Jerusalem. So Bull and the rest of them say it's Jewish. It isn't for the church at all, the body of Christ, because these uh, apostles, they're all Jewish. And uh, that would might sound... Well, solid, except uh, verse 9. There came to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride. Who is she? She is the Lamb's wife. Israel is not the Lamb's wife. Israel is Jehovah's wife. You just read it in Hosea. You just read it. The God the Father said, this nation is married to me, I've given a divorce, I'm not married to them, I'll betroth them later in the tribulation. That can't be the lamb's wife. <laughs> the lamb's wife is not an adulteress to step down on him. The lamb's wife is one chaste virgin. She is the only one of her mother, Solomon Solomon, that begat her. That can't be. The lamb's wife has to be the body of Christ, has to be the church. She's a chaste virgin. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'll show it to you. No way in the world you can handle that thing. You thought about those 12 apostles, those Jewish apostles. Well, I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, or 11, excuse me. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, uh, verse uh, 2. I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused. There's an engagement. To one husband, it's the lamb, 
that I may present you as a chaste virgin. It can't be what you read in Hosea. Hosea is a cast off wife who committed adultery. That's Israel. And remarried to the father, Jehovah. This is a chaste virgin engaged to be married to Jesus Christ, the Lamb. They're not the same. Well, how come the foundation of this city then is uh, Jewish? All right. And turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and I'll show you what Bullinger missed. And Stan missed, and Baker, and the whole bunch of them. Ephesians 2. Those fellows like to pat themselves on the back, and they think they're the only people who study the Scripture. They call themselves Bereans. And that little paper is called the Berean Searchlight. <clears throat> and Stan about to die now, if he hadn't died. <clears throat> the last thing that happened was he got one of the boys from our school named Richard Jordan and got him screwed up. <clears throat> but he couldn't unscrew him in the King James Bible. So Richard Jordan made a mess up there. And he got Richard Jordan up there in Chicago, that Berean outfit, made him associate pastor. And Richard got in there, and Richard was taught how to preach on the street. And he was taught King James. And he did pretty well for a while, and then Cornelius began to get on him about the King James. Cornelius Stam was a five-point Calvinist who used the ASV and the RSV. I've got all his books. I've got all of them. About 12 of them. And he's a five-point Calvinist. He's absolute predestination and unconditional election, this and that. If you want the documentary material, you find the appendices of my commentary on the, on the uh, pastoral epistles. Anyway, they had trouble up there, and they finally almost had a split over it. And uh, during that time, the fellow who was a Christian, who was a policeman, and uh, he'd just been saved, and he uh, got in some bad trouble with the police force before he got saved, and was arrested, and uh, sent to about, spent about 20 years hard time someplace. It must have been a real hard time, because they sent him out to Colorado. In Colorado, the big prison out there is worse than Marion in, uh, in Illinois. Out in Colorado, where they put the big boys, I mean, Gotti and Scarpo and those fellows, that's underground steel tunnels out there. And he's there. And he began to write me. He and I have been corresponding now for about three years. And his thing was, when he finally got saved, he went and uh, joined Stam and Richard at, at Berean Society and got taught this stuff. And the King James issue came up again, and they both jumped him. And he told Richard Jordan, I thought you told me it was the King, the Bible was the Word of God. He said, I think you need to talk to Brother Stan. So Stan had already messed up Richard Jordan in the King James Bible. And so went to Stan, and Stan told him that neither I nor Jordan do believe that what Ruckman believes about it, and that they had a big split in the Berean Society. And it wound up with Richard Jordan taking half of them out, going one way, and Stan going the other way, and they split all the pieces now. And this guy in prison is mad enough to shoot because he was deceived. Richard Jordan made him think that he still believed the King James Bible was the Lord of God when he didn't. That's the kind of stuff you get into. And uh, what these fellows say we're Berean because we study. I'm quoting Acts chapter 17. The Berean searched the scriptures to see if these things were so, therefore many of them believed. So they say the, the Berean searched the scriptures. They call themselves Bereans to make you think they searched the scriptures. Therefore, they know them better than you do because they search them. And it's rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, anybody knows that you should rightly divide the word of truth. Anybody who knows the Bible knows you have to be a dispensationalist of some sorts. You say, why? you got two testaments. <laughs> you want to put them together? Everybody makes a division between Malachi and Matthew. I mean, fellow says not a dispensationalist. He doesn't believe the Bible. So that's true, but they make you think that they're able to rightly divide and make these proper divisions in the right place, and they don't know how to do it. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm still on this New Jerusalem thing, and I'll get back here in a minute, but this needs to be said. Uh, brethren, a uh, right to divide the word of truth is not limited to any such simple procedure as saying Hebrews and Revelation are tribulation for the Jews, and Romans to Philemon is the church for Paul, and Acts the transition period. Now, doctrinally, that is partially so. But boy, oh boy. I'll show you to me. I'm in John. 
First John. If we have fellowship one with another, uh, uh, we confess our sins, faith just forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all righteousness. We walk in the light as he in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God has done from this small sin. Tribulation of the Jew. If you put it over there, you know what it means? It means you shouldn't confess your sins. If that's true. That's where they put it. Now, if that's true, it means you shouldn't confess your sins. You're not in the tribulation. You're not Jewish. Right? See, once you say Hebrews to Revelation is just for the tribulation, you've got yourself in a jam. Because there are all kinds of things there that are right down your alley. For example, the one effectual sacrifice of Christ on the cross is in Hebrews. And that's for you. In plenty of right dividing the word of truth, you can't just put a book here and a book there and say, now I got it. You ain't got it. You got to go through there verse by verse and see what applies and what doesn't. Sometimes it'll mess you up right in the middle of a verse. And you take, Christians shouldn't confess their sins. How many ever heard that taught anywhere? Because see your hands. That's a big grace thing going on these days, see. Now, you know where they get that from? Colossians 1. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So when Christ died on the cross, your sins are forgiven, right? Well, come on, folks, yes or no? Amen. Sure they are. Well, if they're all forgiven, what's the sense of confessing them then if they're all forgiven? See? Now, the answer to that thing is real simple, but these great big brains can't figure it out. And the answer to that thing is, one is talking about your eternal salvation, and one talking about fellowship. And fellowship and salvation are not the same thing. Right. In fellowship, the blood is applied. It's not a judicial act that God takes that makes you safe for eternity. It's a daily application to your walk that keeps you clean. Now, if that thing is just for a Jew in the tribulation, then you know what that thing is saying? That thing is saying that a man can be saved by confessing his sins. You can't be saved by confessing your sins. Amen? Amen. That's what a Catholic teaches then it has to be for a Christian. But there it is sticking right in 1 John. And 1 John, I'll give you 1 John. He that hates his brother in his heart is a murderer, and you know no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. You couldn't put that down in the church age. That's nonsense. You would have said, he that hates his brother, your brother in Christ, how is he your brother in Christ when you don't have eternal life in you? Hear the verse? He that hateth his brother in his heart is a murderer, and you know no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Then how could he be your brother? <laughs> has he got eternal life in him? And you hate him? You couldn't have eternal life in you because there's no eternal life in a murderer. How could he be your brother then if you're unsaved and he's saved? See that mess? In prayer, when you get into 1 John, you'll find verses there that sure are applicable to the tribulation. And they don't apply to you. But you have to be careful, 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 careful. <laughs> because you just can't take the whole book and put it over here. One of the greatest verses in the, on, on assurance in the Bible is 1 John chapter 5. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God. Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? Amen. All right. That you may know you have eternal life. What are you going to make that? Tribulation? But cockeyed nonsense. That's church age. Now here's the rule you go by. Whenever you find a verse that contradicts something Paul said in the Pauline epistles, it goes someplace else. But if it doesn't contradict it, it goes right to you. In plain words, the Pauline epistles are the standard for judging whether the other verse applies to you or not. But boy, there are verses in Proverbs that apply to you. It's full of them. I can take you back to the psalm and find you verse after verse that applies to a Christian. That's David speaking under the law. But that right dividing comes to more than just putting a, that goes there and this goes there. No. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you the, 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 your role model. Here's your role model. Here's the book. Open like this. Here comes Jesus Christ, the synagogue at uh, Nazareth. He comes up to the book of Isaiah and he opens Isaiah 61. 
And he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. What is it, Lord? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor, to send the liver of the captives, to heal the brokenhearted, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. In the middle of the verse. He shut up in the middle of the verse. Now how's that for right at the body? <laughs> he didn't just say Isaiah was for church age. He said part of one verse was for the church age and part of it wasn't. <laughs> You know how that verse ended? I know it ended. And to proclaim the day of vengeance. Second advent. Now in Isaiah 61, there's one verse there that has part of it. Part of that thing is 33 AD and the rest of it is past 1999. And you've got to divide it at the comma. So these brains are stupid. They think right at the dividing things just put the book here and put, nah man, you can't even do that with the verses. I'll show you another one. Matthew, when Matthew and Christ shows up and gets to talk around, going around Bethlehem, uh, Matthew says, then it was fulfilled with written by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and he quotes Isaiah, the people that dwelt in the shadow of darkness, uh, shadow of death, a great light has shined upon them. You know, he quotes that verse. You go back and check that verse in Isaiah, and Matthew leaves out 17 words out of that verse. This takes him right out. You know why he does it? Because the whole two verses that deal with that thing Matthew quoted are second advent verses. And Matthew applies them to the first advent, and to do it, he has to extract 17 words out of the verse to make it fit. And he does. Subtract them from the Word of God. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will do it. The Holy Spirit knows that book so well, he knows just what to take out and just what to put in. I'll give you one more. Paul says it is written, the just shall live by faith. No, it ain't. You never read that anywhere in the Old Testament. Isn't that something? Now, Brian can't handle this stuff too heavy for him. His mind is going, oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I'm in Romans. Paul said the just shall live by faith. The Old Testament doesn't say that at all. What does it say? The just shall live by his faith. How come he left out the his? Because Paul knew something and Habakkuk knew something that no professor at BBC knows. He knows in the Old Testament there's an element of works with faith, so he says the just shall live by his faith. But you don't live by your own faith. You live by the faith of the Son of God that loved you and gave himself for it. And you're saved by grace through faith, and that, not of yourselves. You see that? In plain words, right to mind that word of truth, God, boy, it's got more to it, messing around with saying this goes here and that goes there. You've got to watch that thing. I can show you a place in the Bible where a comma separates 2,000 years five times in a row. So I went back to Genesis 49. That's a good one. Boy, back in there. We're in Ephesians. We're going to hit Ephesians here in a minute. But Genesis 49, he comes through there, he says, he says one place, he says, uh, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. The shepherd of the first advent, John 10, the stone of Daniel 2. In the same verse. There's a verse in there that says, uh, binding his uh, 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 coat to the vine, you know, he, he washed his garments and made them red in the blood of the grapes. The full of an ass, the coat coming in is the first advent, washing his robes in blood, wine, is Isaiah 63, second advent, then the same verse. All right, now here's this Jewish thing. Turn to uh, Ephesians, and Ephesians, notice that the foundation of Jerusalem has to be Jewish because of this. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers, there's the Gentile, and foreigners, there's the Gentile, but fellow citizens with the saints, what saints? Jewish saints of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles. There's the foundation. Just like you found it in Revelation. The foundation had the name of the apostle. There it is. And prophets, Old Testament Jews. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom ye are built together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. That's the body of Christ in the Pauline epistle. And the body of Christ in the Pauline epistle written to the body, 
says that the foundation of your salvation is Jewish, and therefore the foundation of Jerusalem is Jewish, and it's the body of Christ, it's the bride of Christ. And Christ is Jewish too. And by the way, that body doesn't begin in Acts 2, or Acts chapter, or Acts chapter 8, or Acts chapter 18, or with Paul in Acts 9. That body doesn't begin in Acts 28. You know where it begins? Look at verse 14, 15, 16. I'll give you time to read it. It doesn't begin in those pastors. At Calvary. When Christ dies, the opening is made for the body right there. Now, maybe nobody got in and into it till Acts 2, but the body is there at Calvary. So Cornelius Stan doesn't know what the blankety blank he's talking about. And he doesn't study the scriptures. He just shoots off his mouth like a lot of them do. Answer your question is uh, New Jerusalem is a is a body of Christ, the bride, the Lamb's wife, and is made up of saved Jews and Gentiles, and they're built upon the foundation of Israel. All right, something else. Now, it's like a Bible to clear up the college education.